Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Liberty Law Talk is featured at the online journal Law and Liberty, which is available at lawliberty.org. Welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Today we're talking with Sam Gregg about his new book, Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization. Sam Gregg is the Director of Research at the Acton Institute. He, has, he speaks and writes widely in a number of areas, political economy, ethics and finance, natural law theory, and a lot of basic and practical questions and issues around uh, government and policy. He's the author of uh, a dozen books, or maybe more than a dozen books at this point. Um, he's appeared on Liberty Law Talk before. We're glad to have him back and to discuss his new book. Sam, how are you? Richard, it's good to be with you and to be talking about reason, faith, and Western civilization. Okay, so here at the beginning, I'm going to be unfair to you. Uh, but here's how I'm going to be unfair to you. You mentioned Kenneth Clark's civilization series in your book, and that's a civilization. Uh, that's a series I love. I've watched all of the episodes at times, binge watching them, and then going back and watching certain ones. He famously says in the opening, he's standing in front of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, that he can't formulate uh, a definition or a concept of what civilization is. But he says, standing in front of this cathedral, I believe I know it. Uh, I believe I can see it right here. Now, perhaps we won't discuss what it means that it almost burned down recently, what that might mean for Western civilization. But, Sam, can you formulate for us or outline what Western civilization is? Sure. I mean, that is the question which, of course, uh, most people have asked me to begin these conversations with. And uh, it's, it, when you mention Kenneth Clark, I should mention that as you go through the episodes, you realize he does have a very clear definition of what Western civilization is, and he defines it more or less at the end. My definition is a little, a little, I guess, more concise and more pointed than his, in as much as I basically say that I think Western civilization is about three things. One, <clears throat> rational inquiry into truth. This thing, that this idea that our reason is directed towards knowing the fullness of truth, not just scientific truth, but theological, philosophical, political, economic truth. That's the first thing. But that's not enough. The second thing I say is that it's also about this commitment to freedom. If you go back and you look at the struggle of ancient Greece against Persia, uh, if you look at some of the different movements that emerged in Western history, ranging from the emergence of Christianity to the Enlightenment, etc., there's this tremendous emphasis upon freedom. But it's not just freedom in the sense of, hey, I get to do whatever I want. It's freedom directed by this full conception of reason that I talked about before. The third thing I say is that Western civilization is also very much defined by a particular relationship between the world of faith and the world of reason. It's something that first emerges with the Jewish people, the Hebrews, the Israelites before, before Christ. And then I say it essentially takes off uh, with Christianity precisely because <clears throat> Christianity presented this vision of God as Logos. God is not just divine love, but God is also Logos, which means divine reason. The Gospel of John, as you know, begins with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word in, in Greek is Logos. And Logos means divine reason. So the author of the Gospel of John is saying to the readers of his writing that God is reasonable. God is divine reason itself. And that is how we understand the nature of the divinity. And this is very important because what it does is it challenges the dominant pagan mythology. The dominant pagan mythologies are very much the idea that there's lots of gods. They're not particularly interested in the world except in so much as they can manipulate and humiliate human beings. And they're not particularly interested in things like the good, the truth, beauty, etc. Uh, but it also takes the idea of Greek reason very seriously, because I think the Greeks had this tremendous problem. The tremendous problem they had was their philosophy, their inquiries into the natural sciences were leading them in a particular direction, but it was clearly impossible to reconcile with their understanding of religion. Christianity changes all that forever. 
So that's the first thing. Rational inquiry is truth, this emphasis upon liberty, and this idea of God as divine reason. Let, let now, me, I'm let not me, saying... Let me ask you. That, let me, go let me ahead. Just ask you. Western civilization, though, also produces, maybe you're about to get to this, um, not just reason, but also uh, nominalism. Philosophic nominalism yeah. also comes out. It comes out of Christianity, seen also in certain strands in the Protestant Reformation. Is that a, what, what type of a development of reason is that? Well, if you go back to the emergence of nominalism, which essentially happens with a figure named William of Ockham in the medieval period, it's, it's a couple of things. One is that reason really can't know truth in its full sense, that we, we have nominal recognition of what things are, hence the phrase nominalism, but we can't penetrate to the essence of what things are. So that's the first thing. The second thing about nominalism is this idea of freedom is essentially the capacity to choose, to make choices. Not what you choose, not, it does, it's not concerned with whether one choice is better than the other, whether one choice is good or one choice is evil. The focus is upon choice for the sake of choice. And I would argue that, yes, this does emerge in the Christian world, but it's also something that's clearly contrary to what I'll call small O Orthodox Christianity, because small O Orthodox Christianity did not take that view of reason. It did not take that view of uh, free choice. And what's interesting, of course, is that if you if you ask many people what they understand to be freedom today, or even their conception of reason, then I would argue that they're essentially articulating a highly nominalist view. And my argument is that that this is what happens when we lose sight of the full nature of reason, which usually means we have lost full sight of the true nature of the divinity. And this is why in the book I spent a lot of time talking about what I call pathologies of faith and pathologies of reason. These are the things that emerge and which have done so much damage throughout the West whenever we lose sight of the nature of God as Logos. We have these conceptions of reason that become very destructive, but we also have these just conceptions of faith, which also become very, very destructive. Talk about, I want to ask you, you said, you say in the book, Aristotle had a conception of choice. But he didn't have a conception of free choice. Is that, and I want to think about what you're saying here. At some point, intellectually, historically, there's an intersection, we might say, or I, th- I take you to be saying, of the God of the philosophers and the God of the Bible. Does that help us think about what you're saying yes. there, Aristotle's free choice? Yes, it does. Uh, people like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, as they say in the book, they are clearly moving away from the pagan understanding of religion, the pagan religious view of the world. They're clearly on a trajectory that's taking them away from that. But they can't quite get there. They can't quite get there. Because, now, when you say, when you say a pagan, you say a pagan conception of religion, are you just, you're saying is that this is pantheistic, um, a guy, gods who are imminent, uh, who have, Civic loyalty, I mean, come outline that for us. Well, the pagan religion uh, consisted of many things. One is, first of all, this tendency to accord divine status to things like nature, to accord divine status to particular practices like war, or even to accord divine status to particular emotions. So you have gods of love, goddesses of love, gods of war, uh, the gods of the sea, gods of the, the sky, gods who are lightning, etc. So that's one dimension. There's a, there's a highly pantheistic dimension to it. But there's also a heavy element of faith. Faith in the sense of things are just designed in a particular way and you can make choices in your daily life about what you eat, who you, who you marry, if you marry, whether you do X rather than Y, but essentially, all these things are faith. The idea of faith lies very heavily on the pagan view of the world. And if you take the idea of faith and basically say, well, really, yeah, we're sort of making free choices, but actually we're not. This is all sort of set in motion and there's nothing really we can do about it. Then that leads you at 
to a certain conception, a very cramped conception of what liberty is all, all about. It's a type of soft determinism, the type of soft determinism that you find, I would argue, for example, in John Stuart Mill. And this is the problem that the Greek philosophers had. They couldn't get beyond this to say, no, sometimes it really is our free will that decides whether we do X rather than Y. And you find a much stronger affirmation of the reality of free choice, the reality of free will, in the Hebrew Scriptures. The Hebrew Scriptures are very, very clear. If you read, for example, the book of Deuteronomy, that sometimes humans really do make free choices that are driven by nothing other than themselves. And that's very important because the Greeks really can't get quite get there because of this conception of faith and this, this pantheistic conception of religion. But <clears throat> the Hebrew people certainly did. And when that, when you have that conception of liberty at work, that conception of free will at work, that free choice is real, it's not just um, our imagination, it's not something that we're going through the motions of doing, it actually is a real thing, then you arrive at a much deeper conception of liberty, but also a conception of liberty that brings with it much higher degrees of responsibility because if you are really making three choices that shape the world around you as well as yourself, then guess what? You are also responsible for those choices. You have um, a chapter, opening chapter, uh, the speech that shook the world, reflection on Pope Benedict's 2005 Regensburg Address, which is you know, chiefly reported on for being unfair to Muslims. There was uh, violence that erupted in certain parts in the world, uh, mostly by Muslims themselves. Uh, in, in response to the speech, talk about why you think that speech shook the world. Well, as you say, most people remember that Regensburg speech because of the reaction from some sections of the Muslim world, but also some sections from, and let's call it the Western world, there are plenty of people in the Western world who are saying, oh, you can't say things like that. You shouldn't be making criticisms, even implied or even indirect or even even raising the subject that maybe there's something to do with some expressions of Islam when we're trying to understand jihadist terrorism, right? So that's how people generally remember that particular address. But my argument is that that actually wasn't what the essence of the address was about. The address was about us, about us who live in the West. And one of the things that Benedict XVI was trying to do was to say that when you separate faith and reason, when you move away from a conception of God as Logos, when you have a conception of God that sees faith and reason as either opposed to each other, or which reduces faith to fideism, or which reduces reason to just pure rationalism and utilitarianism, then you're bound to have all sorts of problems because that integration of faith and reason, which was carefully worked out over time, starting in the Jewish world and then accelerating in the Christian era, particularly in the medieval period, once you take that away, once that starts to disintegrate or corrode or break down or is actively chipped away at, then the West conception of what it is in terms of its core, its core commitments, in terms of moral commitments, truth commitments, these things start to disintegrate. And when that happens, the West is really losing touch with its essence. That's really what the Reagan's work speech was about. Some people picked this up at the time, but I'm afraid not many did. And the, but the more you read the speech, the more you realize that so much of the development of ideas and Western history more generally can be understood in terms of the integration of faith and reason and then the disintegration of the relationship between faith and reason. And I talk about this in terms of the emergence of particular ideologies, the way that different strands of the Enlightenment reacted to some of these particular issues. And if you look at Western history, which I tried to do in a relatively abbreviated way, you can see these, these pathologies working themselves out, particularly accelerating in the 19th century and then really unfortunately coming to full flower in the 20th century, and in many cases resulting 
in the death and destruction of millions of human lives. Now, let me just sort of think about here. The faith and reason synthesis of the Regensburg Address. How many would say, though, mm, reason doesn't need faith, doesn't need divinity. It can actually find moral truth on its own without God or without any any religious structure there um, and articulate them and provide a you know basis for an ethical, moral, political life uh, for human beings. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of one you know, thinker who, who stands at the forefront, uh, in my mind, Hugo Grotius. I know you're familiar with him. You know, and the idea he has yeah. of reason as if God doesn't exist, uh, something like that. That's his formulation. Right. And he can find within nature rights, uh, truth, and, and, and sort of undergird a system of positive law. And he you know, famously thinks he can do this for international law. Isn't that sufficient? Well, <laughs> if it was, then I guess we'd be living in a world where, let's call it a God-free natural law and natural rights would be operative, right? Mm-hmm. But we don't seem to be living in that type of world. We seem to be living in a world in which people actually question whether there is a natural law, whether there is there are things as natural rights, <clears throat> whether there is there are such things as reason itself. And here's what I think the problem is. First of all, I think reason can't come from nowhere. Reason just can't suddenly pop out of nowhere and say, hey, I'm operative and now I understand the world. Reason, because reason can't come out of unreason. Reason can't come out of nothingness, just as being, existence, can't emerge from nothingness. And this is one of the reasons why I argue in the book that this idea of the creation thesis, by creation I mean that in the end, as people like, uh, Aquinas, but also also some ancient philosophers, non-Christian philosophers, uh, also said there must be a first cause. There must be a being that exists before everything else, from which everything else proceeds. And if that's the case, then to say that reason can somehow operate beyond God or beyond the concerns of faith, faith being understood as judgments we make about the likelihood, the truth of whether there is or is not a God at the beginning of time, etc. To my mind, it's very clear that, well, theoretically you can build an argument for uh, reason being self-sufficient. In fact, Thomas Aquinas would say things like, well, yes, of course, you can argue these things on the basis of reason alone. But in the end, reason itself leads you in the direction of positing the reasonability of the position that there must be a first cause, there must be a divine reason, a logos at the beginning of everything else. So that's typically how I I respond to those sorts of questions. And what's interesting, of course, is that none of this is incompatible with a robust conception to the idea that there is reason and through reason we can know all sorts of different types of truth. In fact, what I would argue is that if you do believe, if you do reason that there must be a first cause, a divine creator, a logos at the beginning of time who remains involved in human history and human time, I would argue that you actually will arrive at a much more robust conception of what reason is and what it can do, but you will also arrive at a conception of the limits of human reason. Because once you accept that there is a divine logos, then you realize that your human reason, while it's powerful, is not all powerful. So in that sense, belief in a divine logos, this idea of the divine creator at the beginning of time, who's actively involved in human history, does does suggest to us that... uh, Reason need not lead us in the direction of trying to build utopias in this world, which a lot of people spent quite some time trying to do in the 20th century, and that did not turn out so well. So reason, you know, in the words of, you're invoking, not, you're not you know, explicitly, but you know, Father Shaw has written several times about this idea of the late Father Shaw of reason asking questions that it can't answer. Correct. 
Uh, Father Charles, of course, was one of the endorsers of the book. And in fact, I think yeah. it may have been the endorsement he wrote for the book may have been one of the very last things he wrote. Yeah. But the fact that reason itself posits these types of questions, is there a God? Where does human reason come from? These in themselves, I think, <clears throat> Father Shaw would argue, and I would argue, lots of other people would argue, that this is reason itself probing the foundations of its own existence. And the notion that reason is ultimately based upon a divine logos, a divine reason, is a heck of a lot more plausible than the idea that it just pops out of nowhere, that it's based upon nothingness. So... In a way, Grotius' question would depend on ignoring metaphysics or not engaging in that work directly. To just say well, reason, Grotius, reason as if Grotius, God, course, reason as if God doesn't exist uh, when we're formulating these rules. Well, Grotius, of course, was a Christian. He was a believer. We know that. What he was pointing to was the capacity of reason to know all sorts of truths about the world including moral truths, without automatically referencing questions of religion, questions of faith, or even sacred revealed texts, or what Jews and Christians call the whole canopy of revelation. Okay. But, uh, but it's still the case, it's still the case, that reason causes us to ask these questions about its own nature and where it comes from. So you can reason as if God doesn't exist, and you can identify all sorts of moral absolutes, all sorts of principles of logic, etc., without explicit reference to God. But at some point, your mind, your reason is going to ask these questions about the bigger, greater order of which your reason itself forms part of. So it's not necessarily a sort of contradiction. It's looking what reason can do under its own volition, and then asking the question about well, where does this come from in the first place and how does it relate to that greater order if there is one in the first place. So I think that these are, these are sort of quite metaphysical questions in, a, in many respects, but they're really important when we're trying to understand the relationship between faith and reason that's so central to the West's identity. Aristotle reasons his way, though, to a God who is a principle. Um, a yes. what not exactly concerned with my existence, but yet is the uncaused cause of my existence, of reason. Yes. But he remains there. He does. And this is where, uh, where revelation becomes very important. And remember, by revelation, we don't mean irrationality. We don't mean mythology. In fact, if you go back and you read the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, one of the things you see is that they're tremendously focused upon getting away from mythology. If you read, for example, the Hebrew Scriptures, the ways in which they critique the surrounding pagan idolatry, they're basically saying, this is nonsense. It is nonsensical to worship trees. It's nonsensical to worship things made of human hands. These things literally make no sense. So Judaism involves this implicit and very direct confrontation of pagan mythology on the basis that pagan mythology is irrational. Irrational. When you turn to the Christian scriptures, to the Gospels, the, the Acts of the Apostles, the letters, etc., you find the same thing. Jesus is not this sort of mythical figure who uh, dies a, a heroic death and remains in the mythology of the gentle community that he left behind, etc., etc., no, the, the Gospels are very, very intent upon describing the realism of what has gone on, that, that God himself has intervened in human history and has entered into human history in the person of this, this person called Jesus of Nazareth. It's only irrational if you believe that, that religion itself essentially consists of mythology. But the Jewish and Christian understanding of religion is not about mythology. It's all about truth. It's all about the idea that there is truth and that we can know it. And it's trying to convey a deep realism about the nature of the universe and how this has worked itself out 
in human history. So when you look at look at the, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures in that way, you, you discover that, you know, revelation and assent to the truths of revelation is about as far away from mythology and superstition as you can possibly get. What are, now, we opened with uh, Benedict's or Regensburg address, he identifies pathologies of reason. Now, we never, in the public, thinking of this speech, we never got to the pathologies of reason uh, in the West because everyone wanted to talk about Islam uh, or his un- supposed unfairness to Islam. But in that speech, he outlines positivism, or we might think of as scientism. And also, there's, there's a twin. There's a twin to that, authoritarian relativism. Can you talk about that relationship? Yes. Uh, pathologies of reason, I think, that Pope Benedict referred to, as you mentioned, positivism, scientism, etc. What do they involve? They involve the confinement of reason to what you might call the scientific and the empirical. Now, Western tradition has always upheld the natural sciences, the empirical sciences, as being very important as giving us very powerful tools for understanding important aspects of reality. But these tools uh, can't explain the whole of reality. And what happens is that when we start to reduce reason to questions of measurement, to questions of calculation, to questions of the empirical, then our capacity to see other truths through other dimensions of reason becomes radically circumscribed, so much so that things like religion, philosophy, morality, well, that all becomes essentially subjective. You can't reason about these things anymore. You just feel your way through these things. So, reason itself, however, gets reduced to the scientific, to to what, what what's described as positivism, to the empirical, etc. And so you try and understand everything about reality in those particular terms. So though, you know, as, as we are frequently told, the only sufficient way to be democratic or to live in a democratic society is to adopt some form of relativism that anyone who would say hold to natural law. We have a piece today on Marianne Glendon, a uh, Harvard Law professor, who has been appointed the head of the uh, new newly formed commission, Unalienable, Unalienable Rights uh, Commission by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. And one of the criticisms of Marianne Glendon is that she is she holds to natural law, making her unsuitable for such a post. And I, and I think part of that comes out of what we're discussing, that criticism of her, that somehow to believe that reason could know moral truths and to hold to that makes you unsuitable for any responsible position in democratic public life. Right. Well, <clears throat> the argument is basically that if you if you are he- adhere to natural law and you believe that there are moral absolutes, then that will eventually lead you to try and impose your particular conception of reality upon everything else, whether it's politics, economics, etc. Uh <clears throat> well, the thing I would I, I would say about that is that uh, politics, whether it's democracy or whatever type of political system you may have, is the arena in which we 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 look at those moral truths and we ask ourselves questions about how do these apply to the polis? How do they apply to the political community? Any society, whether it's an oligarchy, an aristocracy, a democracy has to ask those sorts of questions. And in fact, to say, no, you may not contemplate these questions. No, you may not appoint people to positions of responsibility who hold a particular view on these questions. No, you may not posit these things as being true out loud in the political community. All those things are actually the far greater threat to freedom uh, to to all sorts of things that we celebrate about, about free societies than a commitment to natural law. Natural law as structure, it, it makes people give reasons for why they believe certain things to be true or false. And here's the thing, if we don't have a reference point in natural law when it comes to democratic societies, then there's only, there's only two ways in which we can resolve problems. 
One is through simple authoritarian majoritarianism, if you like. So whatever the majority want at any particular time, and we all know that majorities, the, the, the composition of majorities is constantly changing all the time. Well, we end up just doing whatever the majority says. Well, sometimes the majority get things very badly wrong, and majorities can be just as tyrannical as any oligarchy. So that's one thing. The second thing we end up with is another version of that, which is whoever is the stronger gets to decide. So basically, if you don't have a strong commitment to a full-bodied idea of reason and its capacity to know moral and political and economic and scientific truth, if you don't have that, then you end up with either majoritarianism or, frankly, the, the will to power. Whoever is the strongest, whoever is the most willing and um, has the least inhibitions about using power to get their way. So you end up, you don't, basically, if you don't have some type of conception of natural law at work, <laughs> then you end up with basically a type of soft Nietzscheanism or hard Nietzscheanism. And that's, in both cases, nihilism. Now you're, you're arguing that liberty liberty is central to the West because it is about the freedom uh, to know the truth about myself and to know the truth about my world. I, and, I, and I take it part of, if part of what we're dealing with now is liberty is actually fideistic uh, in a sense. They don't think of it in those terms, but it's this dogma of choice and autonomy for their own sakes to be self-defining, self-constituting, regardless of any sort of nature or, you know, a reality uh, that would help me think about who I am? Well, I think if you look around much of the West today, that's clearly the case, right? Because when you detach liberty from reason, when you detach liberty from truth, uh, then liberty is essentially directional. It's essentially being driven by Will. Whatever is the alternative to reason, which is essentially feelings, emotions, preferences, prejudices, uh, un, uh, notions that I get to do whatever I want because I just should be able to do that, which is the sort of circular argument that you often encounter in these types of circles. But it, it leads to denials of reality. It leads to uh, particular clergymen saying things like two times two equals five or that I can will myself to defy my biological reality of who I am, etc. And that's the type of prison, if you like, our minds get locked into once you essentially deify reason, uh, de deify liberty and separate it from reason's ability to know the truth about reality. By reality, I don't mean pragmatism. I mean the truth about how things are. And when we deny that, then it's inevitable that conceptions of freedom, but not just freedom, conceptions of equality, start to become deeply dysfunctional. Yeah, and I wanted to, you know, there's two, two quotations that I thought worth reading for the audience, and you feel free to expound on them. And, and we've been talking about them uh, throughout this interview, or these, these ideas. One is from Nietzsche, uh, in his book, The Gay Science. So uh, this is a, a quote you uh, list. It is still a metaphysical faith upon which our faith in science rests that even we knowers of today, we godless anti-metaphysicians, still take our fire to from the flame lit by the thousand-year-old faith, the Christian faith, which was also Plato's faith, that God is truth, that truth is divine, end quote. And then much more, Contemporary, uh, the Nobel uh, Prize winning economist, uh, or Nobel laureate, I should say, uh, Vernon Smith, and he strikes a similar theme, and you quote him, the conceptual and theoretical constructs of science constitute, quote, the substance of things hoped for, and observational support depends on instruments that record the evidence of things not seen. As Einstein once said, it is, a, it is theory which first determines what can be observed. But I must add that prior to theory, there's what we call thinking, a systematic form of consciousness uh, 
deeply driven by the unconscious that enables understanding and experimental predictions. The parallel is expressed in John 1.1, 1, 1, quote, In the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. For humans, all beginnings are in thought or reason, end quote. Yes. What uh, Nietzsche and uh, Vernon Smith are driving at there, even though they come from very different uh, positions, Vernon Smith, of course, is Christian, Nietzsche is not. (laughs) But what's interesting is that they both posit the entire scientific enterprise upon certain assumptions about the nature of God, the nature of truth, and how we know these things. And Nietzsche is honest enough to say that, look around, we have all these people in the 19th century who are now atheists or agnostics or philosophical materialists, etc. And they're, they're all into science. Science will save the world, etc. And yet, they can't quite bring themselves to deny some of the foundational premises, let's call them philosophical premises, of the scientific project, that there is truth to be known, that there is order and design in the universe, that the natural sciences can allow us to understand. Nietzsche is basically saying, if if we go down this full path of giving up on God and giving up on the faiths of the West, then we basically have to give up on the scientific project. He's, He's utterly consistent about this. Whereas, and Vernon Smith is saying, um, we stumble along in, in, in the world of the natural sciences, trying to discern all sorts of important things about the world. And what's interesting is that the natural sciences themselves are indicating more and more that there is actually design, that there is order that can be known, which in turn points back to some of the necessary philosophical, even theological premises which the natural sciences need if they're going to get underway in the first place, and if they're going to be continuing to explore and answer the types of questions that they're designed to answer. So it's fascinating to me that someone like Nietzsche recognizes the deep dependence of the natural sciences and the scientific enterprise upon certain conceptions of religion, and he says we have to give up on all that because this religion stuff clearly isn't true. It's nonsense. Smith is saying, no, the natural sciences actually tend to confirm the very philosophical premises upon which the scientific enterprise couldn't get underway, underway without it in the first place if it didn't have these foundations. Now, so faith and science, also interesting um, commentary in, in your book on you know, one of the most famous uh, European commentators right now, Jürgen Habermas, uh, who has posited a constitutional patriotism to try and legitimize the European Union, uh, who is uh, sort of the leading uh, thinker of what it means to be uh, Western now. And uh, he's even uh, seemed to return to, or not return to, but has sort of thought about this dialectical uh, play, dance between faith and reason. Absolutely. Now, he tends to see, Habermas um, tends to see religion in terms of carriers of valuable information. So he describes himself as a type of methodological atheist. But he looks at religion and says there, there, there are forms of knowledge that are conveyed through religion, and in the case of the West, that's Judaism and Christianity, that reason itself probably would not have been able to arrive at. He also points out that uh, Judaism and Christianity have never denied that reason can arrive at many truths relatively unaided, and that that in the case of Christianity, it's particularly embodied a strong conception of natural law, which enables you to engage in philosophical, moral, political reflection without necessarily immediately invoking the claims of revelation. So he's very much aware of that. The other thing about Habermas, which is interesting, is that, as you say, he's sort of representative of, of much West, the, of what the West is now. 
And that's important because he's, he's a type of symbol of, let's call it post-enlightenment thought. And one of the things I try and do in the book, to do in the book, is show that, that the idea that the various enlightenments which began emerging at the end of the 17th century and, and, and which still exert tremendous influence today, the, the idea that the enlightenment, holus bolus, was completely opposed to Christianity and religion and that Christianity, Judaism, and religion were somehow holus bolus opposed to the different uh, ways of reasoning, the, diff- the new learning, as it was called, that was associated with the Enlightenment. One of the things I try and say is that it's, it's just much more complicated than that. Yes, there are figures like Voltaire, who clearly have a major problem with Christianity, but he's actually relatively atypical of 18th century Enlightenment thinkers. There was even a thing called the Catholic Enlightenment, whereby there were plenty of Catholic clergymen, Catholic lay people who believed what Catholicism taught, but were also interested in the new learning that was being developed by Enlightenment thinkers. Or take Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is a Christian. There's no question about that. In fact, part of his, uh, some of his later writings are explicitly directed to refuting on philosophical and scientific grounds the, the mechanistic accounts of the emergence of the, the universe. Or if you go to the Scottish Enlightenment, which exerted such influence upon the founding of the United States, who are most of the people involved in the Scottish Enlightenment? Most of them, well, overwhelmingly they are believing Christians, and a fair number of those are um, ministers of the Church of Scotland. Someone like David Hume is very much an outlier when it comes to understanding the development of the Scottish Enlightenment and its view of religion. And that's very important for the United States because, as, as I said, the Scottish Enlightenment was highly influential upon the American founding and in 18th century America. And what you find there is that there's no sense among most 18th century American uh, members of the clergy or churchgoers at the time, that there's somehow this irreconcilable conflict between Christianity and the new learning. And one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to sort of put a little bit of a corrective to those who see the world of faith and the world of the Enlightenment as somehow locked in this death struggle to the very end. I find it interesting, for example, that uh, Benedict XVI, when he was writing in the pers- as Joseph Ratzinger, you know, the theologian, what you find with his writings is that he, mo- most of his writings that involve some reflection upon the political order, social order, the, or the question of the natural sciences, they almost all begin with the Enlightenment. And he has a relatively positive view of the Enlightenment, and he emphasizes the need to distinguish the different stages and types of Enlightenment from one another. The late French Enlightenment clearly has a strongly anti-religious dimension. The early French Enlightenment, not so much. Uh, so that's, ch- and I know that this is a message that I think is challenging those who, who, on either side of that debate, who basically see these things as, as essentially at, as being at war with each other. Now, I do say that there are some aspects of Enlightenment thought which later became very, very disruptive, but I'm, I'm, I would be very hesitant before saying to religious believers, you need to basically reject the entire Enlightenment project. Because I fear that there's quite a number of religious believers in the academy now who more or less hold that position. And not to mention some of our rising post-liberals who are now writing uh, quite frequently on these issues to reject all of liberalism or even, as I've heard them say, all of Enlightenment thought. Uh, So... No, I, I can imagine that ideas, those ideas would challenge. I, I suppose also there's a larger historical narrative around this as well, which is Christianity goes to war with itself. Uh, can, you, know, ki- you know, we kill each other essentially, and yeah. the, the, the way around yeah, that also, is is the, also, is the liberal uh, modern Enlightenment state. There's also the tremendous achievements of science apart from religion, or as we're told, right. in the face of religion, some of that justified which justifies a more secular society and reducing religion to a private, uh, you know, f- uh, scope. Of course, in this country, there's you know, the famous you know, Scopes trial, uh, 
where you, you know you, where we're told this is part of the narrative that you know religion would actually impede scientific investigation, things like that. So there's, I guess, of there's course. those things as well that sort of add momentum to this. Exactly, and one of the things my book does is point out that if you look at the foundations of the natural sciences, we shouldn't be surprised that they achieve a certain degree of stability and clarity in the medieval period when you do see this very close integration of faith and reason because <laughs> because if you are a believer at this time and you hold to this integration of faith and reason, then you are interested and curious about knowing about the Logos and how that Logos has manifested himself in the world that surrounds us. So people uh, like uh, Bonaventure, uh, people like Albertus Magnus, the idea, or Aquinas for that matter, the idea that these people were somehow opposed to science or for that, for that science was something that would threaten uh, the claims of revelation, they found that to be nonsensical. Nonsensical. It's also the case, if you look at a lot of the 18th century Enlightenment thought, you find lots of other people thinking more or less the same type of way. Newton is a very good example of that. He, he never thought that there was, there was bound to be this inevitable conflict between the claims of revelation and the discoveries of natural science. You find that again and again and again. And what you discover is that the narrative has more or less been captured by these sort of outlier cases where you see particular Enlightenment thinkers and their particular take on these issues being seen as the standard Enlightenment analysis of the relationship between religion and science. So thinking here, I mean, as, as we bring to a close our, our discussion, you know, one conclusion that I take away from the book is the way Sam Gregg articulates liberty uh, to know the truth, uh, the way Sam Gregg articulates reason, and that there's a, a foundation to reason. The notion that the Western civilization, that Western civilization uh, is the intersection of the God of the philosophers and the God of the Bible. All of these things sound uh, at times strange to people, uh, foreign to the way we think about these ideas, uh, even threatening and offensive. And I am I conclude the West now doesn't understand itself, doesn't understand its own foundations. And there's a lot of ominous conclusions one can draw from that. Um, I'll let you have the last word. <clears throat> yes. Uh, most books about Western civilization fall into one or two categories. One is that it's bad, the whole thing is bad, it, it should just go away. The other is, well, Western civilization was a marvelous project, but it's essentially dead because, as you say, uh, the West doesn't understand itself anymore. These things are incapable of being revived. And my book is different insofar as I basically end on an optimistic note. And my argument is that if you can get back to a conception of God as Logos, if you can get back to the idea that God is all-powerful, God for Christians and Jews is love, but God is also divine reason, then a lot of many good things start to click back into place. Suddenly faith and reason are not seen as being at war with each other. Suddenly the idea that reason is, is purely the natural sciences or just purely positivistic looks a lot less plausible. Suddenly fideism starts to look deeply implausible as well. And when you have this foundation put back in place, then we're capable of having reasoned discussions about the nature of the natural sciences. Uh, we're, we're capable of having reasoned discussions about the nature of reason itself, the nature of freedom itself, what truth is, what truth isn't, etc. If you can get that foundation back into place, then I think, many good things will necessarily flow from that. Now, that's hard because we live in a world where religion in much of the West has been reduced to either fideism or its flip side, which, of course, is uh, sentimental humanitarianism. And as Benedict XVI says, those who live in, who are the sort of self-proclaimed heirs of the Enlightenment Project seem to be locking themselves even deeper 
and deeper into a type of bunker. Uh, and my book says, no, it doesn't have to be this way. If, you, if people of faith need to engage reason and realize the full grandeur of the nature of reason, people of those who are described themselves as men and women of reason need to seriously engage the religion question and ask themselves the question of whether religion is really about mythology or whether religion is actually about truth claims. And I think at different points of history, people have done this and we've seen different types of recoveries and renewal in the West, which is one of the things about the West. It does seem to have this capacity for renewal and recovery, and that usually occurs when it goes back to its roots. So, the, so to the extent that the West can go back to this particular conception of the nature of God as Logos, to the extent that it can still do that, I'm relatively optimistic about its future. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Sam Gregg, the author of Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is your host, Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.